We'll get the latest on the fighting in Ukraine with Charles Stratford in a moment. But first, let's head to Moscow. Mohamed Val is tracking developments there. Uh, Mohamed, what uh, has Russia been saying about the referendum? Yeah, it's uh, actually here in Russia, it's a rosy picture. The media talking only about uh, the turnout, even though they didn't give uh, very uh, high uh, figures. Uh, Saturday, for instance, according to TASS agency, it was between 23 and 26, but they expected it to rise during the uh, following days. And uh, uh, the same media also talking about 93% uh, of those who cast their ballots in Zaporizhia, for instance, they chose to join Russia. And in Donetsk, the authorities there talking about uh, 236 people have already voted, and that's a big number, big number considering that uh, the operation so far is limited because of security reasons. Phase one will end on, uh, on the 26th, and the 27th there will be an open day of voting in, in, uh, in polling stations. Uh, as usual, that's when the biggest number is expected to turn out. And that will be that will be the final day. Uh, news here, also news media talking about a quick uh, uh, result being announced quickly. I mean, uh, on the following day, on the 28th, the results will be announced uh, uh, by the evening. And uh, uh, on the day after that, the state Duma is expected to meet and endorse those results. That's when probably on the 30th, uh, President Vladimir Putin will give a speech and uh, officially declare those four regions officially part of the Russian Federation. OK, that's Mohamed Val for us in Moscow. We're now going to go to Charles Stratford, who uh, joins us now from Kyiv. Uh, Charles, you've got more on uh, the latest fighting in the East overnight. That's right, yes, as those votes continue, those votes that are considered by the international community and the UN to be completely illegitimate, there are reports, certainly according to the Ukrainian authorities, of what they describe as heavy shelling um, and bombing of various areas uh, in the east and the south, in those areas that, uh, that are along the contact line. The Ukrainians saying at least 35 what they describe as settlements were hit by Russian strikes in the last 24 hours. There are also reports that we, again, cannot independently verify of what the Ukrainians are describing as Iranian kamikaze drone strikes on an administration building in central Odessa in the south. But as I say, we cannot independently verify that. We know that um, the Ukrainians have accused the Iranians of supplying Russia with these drones. It's something that the Iranians have staunchly denied. Um, the Ukrainians have uh, already uh, diluted, if you like, their relationship with the Iranians here. They've punished the ambassador by taking away his accreditation um, and demanding that a number of diplomats from the Iranian embassy leave. The Iranians are saying that they will respond um, with some sort of proportional response in the coming days. Um, interestingly, also, there are reports on the Russian side of con uh, line of control. They saying that there was a hotel in the occupied town of Kherson that the Ukrainian military hit this morning. Um, there are reports, again, that cannot be independently verified of journalists staying in that hotel. At least two people reported injured, possibly dead. So, as I say, as this illegitimate vote goes forward, according to the international community, a lot of heavy fighting on various locations along the contact line in the east and the south. OK, Charles, uh, that's Charles Stratford for us, uh, live from Kyiv. Thank you. The Kremlin's military mobilisation has prompted more people to flee Russia. Serbia is one of just a few countries Russians can travel to without a visa. Jonah Hull has this report from the capital, Belgrade. No to war, they chant. Russia without Putin. It isn't clear exactly who their protest is aimed at. They're Russians in self-imposed exile against the war in Ukraine, their presence tolerated by staunch Kremlin ally Serbia, one of only a few countries to which Russians can travel now visa-free. My voice might be a drop in the ocean and maybe it won't be heard, but I have to speak out anyway. 
Alexei Novikov is among an estimated 50,000 Russians who've landed in Belgrade since war broke out in February, many on one-way tickets. The pace of arrivals is thought to have escalated in recent days, with young men in particular escaping President Vladimir Putin's partial mobilization of reservists. I don't want to take part in a war against the Ukrainian people for some unclear, vague objectives. And probably very soon they will try to mobilize in Russia en masse, and they will take anyone they can catch and send them to the front line to be used as cannon fodder. So-called brother nations, their fellow Orthodox Slavs in Serbia, offer the Russians familiarity and a warm reception. But given the political ties between Belgrade and the Kremlin, it's an unlikely harbor for dissent. I feel that people don't understand that Russians are against the war. Uh, they really feel that uh, Putin and Russia is equal, and I want to express my feelings that it's not, and that we are really against the war. No one is suggesting that small expatriate populations like this one, however vocal, are about to turn public opinion in Russia against President Putin or the war. For one thing, it's highly unlikely they'll even be seen or heard by most Russians on state-run media. But many people here do feel that the recently announced mobilization or call-up of reservists is likely to bring a new awareness of the war to Russian homes and Russian society. And that, in turn, is a step closer towards a possible tipping point. It is one thing to sit on a couch and contemplate how we are conquering Ukraine, and quite another to be in a trench with a machine gun. So I think that the dissatisfaction of the people is already quite strong, because those citizens who support Putin and the war have started to express their dissatisfaction with what is happening in Ukraine. And the mobilization now will push people to protest against it. From a place of relative safety now, having left their old lives behind, these Russian dissenters are determined to play their part. Jonah Hull, Al Jazeera, Belgrade. Russia has reshuffled its military leadership, naming Colonel General Mikhail Mazintsev as Deputy Defence Minister. He'll be responsible for logistic operations. He's under Western sanctions for his role in the bombardment of Mariupol. Kyiv officials accuse him of planning the siege in which thousands of civilians died as residential buildings were destroyed. Mazintsev has also been accused of orchestrating the bombing campaign that levelled much of rebel-held Aleppo in Syria back in 2016. Well, let's bring in Samir Puri. He is a military analyst and author of Russia's Road to War with Ukraine. He joins us from Singapore. Thank you very much for being on the programme. Uh, now, Mazintsev has been dubbed the butcher of Mariupol by many Ukrainians, as we heard, and he's been described as a hardliner within Russia. So do you think we're going to see an even more ruthless Russian military now? Yeah, thanks very much for having me. Uh, these reshuffles are, are quite common because Russia's war efforts has been plagued by difficulties. But your question is, is touches on a really important subject, which is, are we going to see more indiscriminate bombardments of parts of Ukraine that Russia is yet to conquer? And I think the answer is yes. And, and very simply, it's this. At the start of the invasion, the Russian armed forces tried to operate with a bit more finesse, parachute drops and sort of advanced raids into Kiev and Kharkiv. It all failed and they reverted to type. And type is very sadly the sorts of campaigns we've seen in, in Aleppo in Syria, and Mariupol in, in southern Ukraine, as you mentioned. Devastation of the cityscape and Russia claiming that as a conquest. He's taking over logistics and supplies. Why do you think that's been such a major issue for Russia's military in this war? Right, well, you know, amateurs talk about strategy, professionals talk about logistics. That's one of the aphorisms that sometimes goes around discussion about military operations. And one of the reasons that Russia's armed forces have struggled in Ukraine comes down to logistics. It comes down to uh, armed forces advancing without proper lines of supply, disconnected from other lines of advance. Remember, Russia invaded from, from multiple angles of Ukraine. So bringing kind of control to this chaos has been uh, an uphill struggle for Russia's defense ministry and its military command ever since the early days of the invasion started, things started to go wrong. So indeed, Mikhail, 
uh, Minister will be really responsible, I think, for digging Russian forces in for the long haul. And this then ties in with this partial mobilisation order we've also seen happen this week. And do you think this is a direct result of the ground uh, lost to Ukrainian forces over the past month or so? Certainly, it's, it's uh, part of Russia's reorientation to this new reality in which, as you say, Ukraine has been able to retake some of its occupied land, deoccupation, as Zelensky calls it. And, of course, the Russians will be alarmed that the possibility of a Ukrainian offensive spreading further along the front line uh, it could become something that the Russians are dealing with. So I think certainly the Russians are not on, on the front foot, they're on the back foot and stabilising that position and playing, I think, for, sorry to use a sporting analogy, playing for the whistle, playing for winter, which means making sure that the Russians don't lose any more of what they hold before winter sets in will be one of uh, Mikhail Minetsev's goals, I think. We've heard US officials say there is an increasingly dysfunctional command structure in Moscow. Uh, do you think that that is the case as well? So the report, of course, no one can tell you 100% as to how this war is being run, but the reports that are surfacing, some things in the media, suggest there is something of a sort of a 100 kilometer screwdriver, so to speak, which means that key command and operational decisions are being taken in Moscow. Whereas other armed forces might delegate those to field commanders, it appears that Putin and those immediately around him have tried to micromanage the war from very far away, perhaps often with poor information, delayed information. Uh, that, and I think the aforementioned point, which is the Russians invaded from a lot of different directions at the very start, and it just meant that their military campaign was just mal-coordinated right from the start. And they've been trying to, I think, gain some coherency ever since then. Samir Puri, thank you very much for your time and your analysis.